so one last concept and then we will end this discussion we will move to the structure side of the story and that is the deaggregation of seismic hazard i will just introduce that concept uh, what deaggregation mean and how it will be useful if you get those results for any particular site deaggregation means that decomposing the seismic hazard number at your site into the contribution of different seismic sources right i i get a hazard curve which is a combined hazard curve from let's say five seismic sources around me i can also have uh, five different hazard curves each coming from each seismic source and then one combined hazard curve also that representation of hazard will give me a more insight into which source is contributing how much in my final number right and that information will be used in the selection of ground motions for dynamic analysis let's say that uh, i have uh, five faults for example one is normal fault one is another type strike slip another one and these five faults contribute to my site hazard at my site all i can do is that i can get as the result of psha i get the hazard curve probability of accidents in some years and let's say pga but this is a combined hazard curve combined hazard curve from all five sources you have seen that we add their pro accidents rates right but i can also construct five different hazard curves one from each source and then i also represent i add them and construct the final one also right now these individual lines will tell me that which which fault is contributing how much to my final number it may be possible that let's say this is my final hazard curve one fault is having a hazard curve like this and one may be having a hazard curve like this which means that this one is not contributing significantly but this one is contributing significantly now let's say this one which is contributing significantly is normal fault and this this one is strike slip this information is very useful because when i select the ground motions for dynamic analysis i have to first select because in the ground motion database we have thousands of records which are recorded from different types of faults which were produced by different types of faults right so i'll filter out all those records which were from a normal fault only because this is a kind of fault which is contributing the hazard the most at my site and i'll not consider strike slip now because it this kind of a fault is not um, contributing at the hazard at my site right so ultimately this information will tra trans translate into uh, the selection of most representative earthquakes which can occur in future at my site so the faulting mechanism for example the slip rate because now i know that fault a is contributing most and fault b is contributing the least so fault a i should focus more all the characteristic of fault a should be used to select future earthquake because it is the most likely contributor in future earthquake right so this information getting information about the decomposition of seismic hazard is called deaggregation and one way to have that information is plot the individual hazard curves for each source and combined also and then analyze now it may be possible that in one pga range one fault is governing and in another pga range another fault is governing i'll show you one example so let me skip that detail um, uh, it is actually the process of breaking down the hazard into contribution from different earthquake scenarios right so let's say this is an example this solid black line is uh, one combined hazard curve let's say and these two dotted lines are from two different uh, <coughs> sources individual sources now you can see that uh, in this pga range this line this dotted line is giving you a high probability of accidents but in the high pga range the other dotted line is giving you a high probability of accidents right so i can get an information like this also 
that uh, this is a PGA range which can occur at my site from this fault A, uh, but uh, this is a PGA range which can occur from another fault at the same site, right? So, low magnitude earthquakes, low level earthquakes, the site is more exposed to low level earthquakes from another fault or another source and high level earthquakes from another source, right? This is very useful information. So, if I am designing my building for a low PGA, I should consider a different seismic source which is more dangerous for me for example and if I am designing for a high PGA another one, right? So, this also can be, this information can also be obtained. Uh, here you also see combined line, solid black line and individual fault lines or individual sources line also and obviously, hazard curve can be in PGA or can be in SA at any time period also. So, even you can compare this thing that you may come up with this information that PGA is being governed by this fault, but SS is being governed by another fault or S1 is being governed by another fault. Now, what is SS and S1? Spectral acceleration experienced by short buildings and long buildings. So, you may translate that information into this information that my low rise buildings are more vulnerable from that particular fault and high rise are from another fault or another seismic source, right? So, I am just giving you an idea that what information you can get from the results of de-aggregation, right? This is an example of de-aggregation performed for different cities in Pakistan. So, we were able to identify that um, uh, which source is contributing how much at the hazard of the uh, in the hazard at a particular city for example. So, I will skip all that information. One last thing uh, is uh, another representation of de-aggregation results and that is a 3D graph. 3D graph can be plotted on the map also and it can also be plotted separately like this. So, I let me use this one to explain what it is. On y axis you have the percentage contribution to hazard. Let us say my PGA at this definition of hazard, let us say DBE level and this is my PGA or spectral acceleration at some time period. This number let us say comes out to be 0 0.5 g. Now, from uh, in that 0 0.5 g, how much is being contributed is on y axis, right? And on the floor you have magnitude range magnitude let us say 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and on the other side you have distance source to side distance 20, 30, 40 kilometers. So, each column in this floor is giving you a magnitude and source to side distance pair which is contributing in my number which is 0.5 g let us say right. So, a uh, longer or higher tower is giving me the m r pair which is contributing the most. Let us say from this kind of uh, um, obviously, this can be plotted as a result of de-aggregation which I will not explain I just uh, keep the discussion up till this point, but once you have this information you may, may be able to say that um, uh, a magnitude 6.2 occurred at a distance r equal to 53 kilometer let us say this is a m r pair which is contributing the most in my 0 0.5 g, right? You will get this kind of an information as a result of uh, de-aggregation. Now, what is the use of this m r pair, most contributing m r pair? You can use it to select future ground checking actually uh, ground motions for dynamic analysis, right? So, because in international databases, you have to select a magnitude and source to side distance to filter out the ground motions from that. So, you obviously, you will use this pair to filter out the, the ground motions from that database. Uh, all those ground motions which uh, have a magnitude 6.2 and which were recorded at source to side distance 53 kilometer, they are more representative to occur at your site than any other MR pair, right? So, you will use this pair or some range of magnitude and some range of uh, distance in this range uh, to select future ground shaking actually to select uh, the earthquake for dynamic analysis 
uh, for your buildings right so all that information will actually uh, be very useful for the dynamic analysis of buildings so which means that um, it is not that simple that you construct a computer model and make a dynamic analysis load case and run it that that is structural engineers perspective behind that is all that science how you finally arrive at that ground motion set 7 or 11 which should be imported in your analysis program and then run that load case right that should be the most representative of the future ground motions which can occur potentially at your building site right 